Well, good morning, church. We are so glad you came to worship with us today. Would you please stand and worship with us?
church if we belong to him. We have confidence today. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. Cause you are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. Welcome to Shelby Christian Church. I'm glad to see all of you here this morning. I'm Bobby Woods, a discipleship pastor here, and I am thrilled, of course, to be up here and be able to share a little bit with you this morning. Um, in this, this summer, we've been reading through the New Testament, and as we read through the Gospels, uh, something really struck me, that as Jesus would start his day and spend time in prayer, but then he would go about his day, and it always seemed like no matter where he was headed, he would get interrupted. Somebody would come up to him and want a healing, or somebody would come up and want a miracle, or want, some, want him to do something. And Jesus didn't get upset or discouraged by that, but instead he saw those things as opportunities to do the will of God. And so he was very flexible in his ministry. He saw those opportunities as God working, and he joined his father in that work by doing a healing, by casting out a demon, by doing some kind of miracle. And I guess as I thought about that, I thought about the fact that in our lives, we don't like being interrupted, do we? I mean, I know as men, sometimes we get in these little work boxes, and as we're in it, we, we don't like distractions. We don't like being thrown off and going in a different direction. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God is always at work. He never tires. He never sleeps. He never stops. He is always at work. And so when God interrupts you in your day, you need to stop and take that opportunity to join him in how he's working. Maybe it's somebody who comes up to you and said, man, I've had a really hard day. Well, let me pray for you then. Maybe somebody's begin to share something spiritually with you. That is God at work and you need to stop. And now that we're in the middle of our service, this morning we take time to, for communion. So I want you to just stop and take in this moment of being in communion with our Christ, with the one who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let us take time to share in that cup and in that bread and be reminded of the sacrifice that he did for us and most of all of the resurrection which freed us. Let's pray together. Father God, as we come this morning, 
I pray that our schedules are not so tight and so busy that we cannot be interrupted by the Holy Spirit. So when those opportunities come and we are interrupted, I pray that we would stop and to join you in what you're doing. Whether it's a prayer or just a few words of encouragement, Father, I just pray that you would help us to just let go of that moment and give it to you. And this morning as we pause for communion, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just be so present among us, that your glory would just reign among us, that you would anoint Ethan and the band as they continue to lead us this morning. And that you anoint Pastor Dave and let him speak your words this morning. Father, your love for us is so great. Greater than we can ever begin to imagine. And Father, we thank you that you love us in spite of ourselves. And we offer ourselves to you this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. church. I think I got the button turned right. There we go. All right. Hey, we're glad you are here. We're glad if you're online with us. Uh, it has been a crazy, I have to feel like crazy fast summer. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. Kids are back in school right now. <laughs> Hopefully everything stays good. And, and yet God is still doing incredible, incredible things. Uh, we've been having baptisms every week. And, and sometimes y'all don't get to celebrate them in first service. They typically happen in second, third. We got one today and third that we know of, maybe more. Uh, and so it's exciting to see what God is doing. We're in the middle of this series that we're calling Playground. And if you got your Bible with you this morning, I, I want you to get it out, open to Luke chapter 8, and just hang on to it. All right, we're going to get there. Uh, Luke chapter 8, and we've been talking about lessons that we learned on the playground of life early on that we need to be reminded of today in this way we live our life. And, and today's lesson is, is a, a timely one, I think. Nobody likes a bully. Nobody likes a bully. But they're on the playgrounds, right? But they're not just on the playgrounds. They are walking the halls in school, but they're also walking the halls in our office buildings, in our factories. Uh, they are on the internet far, far too often. They're all over the place in politics. But, but guys, we got to be honest. There are bullies around the Christian world today, especially attacking the Christian world today. I, I want to begin by just giving you you some very sobering facts. In 2019, there were 150 countries in the world where it was either illegal or at the very least unsafe to proclaim yourself as a Christian. And yet 245 million, 245 million Christians live in the 50 most oppressed nations in the world. One out of nine Christians living today experience extreme persecution because of their faith. And just so you know, that doesn't include any of us. 
because none of us are at that level of persecution. In 2018, there were 4,136 known martyrs in the world. That's people that we know were executed because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And I think evidence would show us today that more and more, the most persecuted, bullied, harassed group of people worldwide are Christians. That shouldn't surprise us. It's been going on for a long time. It's been going on since, since Jesus walked the planet. So, so how, do we, how do we respond? What do you do when you deal with that stuff, when you're faced with that stuff, that bullying, that harassment, that persecution uh, that comes along with your faith. Jaron Jackson recently said, I'm grateful first to God for giving me a platform to preach the gospel of Jesus and him crucified. I'm grateful for this country and the opportunities it gives no bodies with dirt in their cuticles. In a weird way, I am thankful for the fight that we have on our hands. Such an amazing time to be serving Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. I think this is an awesome time to be the church. Not the building, but the people, not just the people, but the people with a message. Because the message that we have as the church is the message that the entire world needs. A message of hope, a message of fun, a message of joy, a message of all the things that are supposed to happen on the playground when we're little kids, but that some kind, sometimes get derailed when a bully comes along. Paul told the church in, in Ephesus to be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those that are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. The Bible describes Satan many different ways. One of the easiest ones, at least for me to imagine, is when he talks about that he's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And whether you've been uh, to, to Africa or somewhere and actually been on a safari or you've watched it on National Geographic or on some movie, we, we can pretty quickly get a mental picture, can't we, of a, of a lion kind of making his way around a, a herd of innocent antelopes or some other animal trying to figure out which one they're going to attack because they're going to attack the one that's off by itself. You watch those videos, the lion never attacks the center of the herd. It just never happens. The lion attacks that one animal that's wandered off by itself, that one animal that's on the fringes. And slowly but surely, over a period of time, the goal would be to keep picking off the one on the fringe till eventually the herd is gone and no more. You think Satan's trying to do that to the church today? You think Satan's trying to work as a bully, trying to divide us today? You think that's going on? Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that there are blood-bought, born-again Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, who choose to wear a mask today? Absolutely. But guess what? There are also blood-bought, born-again believers and followers in Jesus Christ that choose not to. There are blood-bought, born-again followers of Jesus Christ that choose to get vaccinated, and there are those that choose not to. Do you think Satan's trying to divide us? There are blood-bought, born-again followers of Jesus Christ that love loud worship music, and there are blood-bought, born-again followers of Jesus Christ who don't like loud music, and there are blood-bought, born-again followers of Jesus Christ who are rich and those who are poor. There are those who are black and there are those that are white and there are those that are brown. There are those that vote Democrat and those that vote Republican and those that vote Independent. There are those that cheer for the cats and those that cheer for the cards and those that cheer for the blue, blue devils. See, you cannot even say it. And I'm not even really sure any blood-bought, born-again Christian can cheer for any devil. So where do we go with that? I don't know. All I'm saying is don't let the enemy bully you and to believing that somehow where you stand is the right place to stand other than what's in here, other than what's in God's Word. 
See, the enemy is trying to divide us over stupid stuff. And right now, unfortunately, I think he's doing a pretty good job. Paul warned Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that there would be very difficult days ahead. Jesus taught in John 16 that uh, we shouldn't be surprised by persecution or bullying over our faith. And he told the disciples, it's even going to get worse. So I want us to dig in here and see a story in Scripture that you may never have thought of in terms of bullying, but it's a, it's a somewhat familiar story. It has some characters that you go, oh yeah, I remember that one. It's in Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 26. Jesus is already into his ministry time, and he's been traveling around. He's been teaching. And in Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 26, it says, They arrived in the region of Gerizines along the lake of Galilee. And as Jesus is climbing out of the boat, a man who was possessed by demons, notice the S there, demons, multiple demons, came out to meet him. For a long time, he had been homeless and naked and living in the tombs outside of town. This guy's got it rough. He's got, it's not a good situation. And he's all alone. And as soon as Jesus saw him, he shrieked and fell down in front of him. Now, let me be very careful here. Let's be very careful to understand. When it says he shrieked or he yelled, it wasn't Jesus. It was the man. And it was done by the demons inside of the man. And he fell down in front of him. And then he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Did you 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 notice that right there? Who recognized Jesus? Who knew who Jesus was? The, The demon knew. The demons knew who he was. And they were terrified of him. They said, Please, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already commanded the evil or the unclean spirit to come out of him. The spirit had often taken control of this man, even when he was placed under guard and put in chains and shackles. He he simply broke loose and rushed out in the wilderness, completely under the demon's power. Jesus demanded, what's your name? Legion, he replied. For he was filled with many demons, a group of demons, a legion of demons. The demons kept begging Jesus not to send them into the bottomless pit. Notice the de- Notice what they recognized. They recognized who Jesus was, and they also recognized what he could do. And it says, there happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. And the demon begged, the demons begged for them to let him enter the pigs. So Jesus gave them permission. And then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the entire herd plunged over the steep hillside into a lake and drowned. Wow. Notice some things in that story. This group of demons pick on this guy, whether he was already homeless or he became homeless because then we don't really know, but he's, he's a guy that's on his own. He's on the fringe of society. He's out there by himself, and they pick on this guy. He's one on the fringe of the earth, and one, just, not just one demon. It's not just a big bully demon. It's the whole gang of demons that come and, and pick on this guy. And the demons, as we said, they recognize Jesus. They're afraid of Jesus. But Jesus shows up and makes a difference. He changes the situation. It's like in the movies or on a TV show or maybe in real life for you. It's like that moment when Big Brother shows up. When you've been getting picked on, you've been getting beat up, and all of a sudden, the the one that's doing that kind of stops and steps back because they realize that Big Brother... The enforcer, the equalizer has just shown up. In 1984, the equalizer first came out on TV. A guy named Edward Woodward played Robert McCall as a retired intelligence agent who had all these like inside mysterious past kind of things, but was able to covertly help people when they were in bad situations. Then in 2014, Denzel Washington starred in a movie, the movie version, The Equalizer. And now we're in season two of Queen Latifah as the female equalizer coming into these situations to help people who 
who are being picked on and bullied on and put in bad situation. And what that tells me, the fact that there were now, <clears throat> in the second version of a TV show, we had a movie. You know what that tells me? People are looking for an equalizer. There's enough junk going on in people's lives that everybody is kind of intrigued about or looking for an equalizer. But the greatest news that I could share with you this morning is that Jesus Christ is the greatest equalizer ever. And he showed up on this scene and everything changed. The, the Satan even tried to bully Jesus, though. Look what happens next. Jesus has cast and has let the demons go out of this man. They went to the pigs. The pigs ran over the cliff and says, when the herdsmen saw it, they fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. And people rushed out to see what had happened. And a crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been freed from the demons. He was sitting at the feet of Jesus, fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. Does that make any sense to you at all? When he was possessed by demons and running around crazy, they weren't afraid. But when he's sitting at the feet of Jesus, fully dressed, fully sane, they became afraid because they didn't know how to deal with the equalizer. Then those who had seen what had happened told the others how the demon-possessed man had been healed. And all the people in the region of Gerizim begged Jesus to go away and leave them alone. For a great wave of fear swept over them. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make sense on any level at all. You would think, first of all, that if you're, if you're any kind of a person, if you're any kind of a human, and you see someone who you know has been getting that stuff kicked out of them, they've been having a rough time, everything has been bad, and suddenly everything got better, you would think that everybody, oh, that's awesome, man. I'm so happy for you. That's so great. Way to go, Jesus. And it's the exact opposite of that. Satan is already working, trying to be the bully, trying to instill fear. People were afraid that people were getting better. I mean, you can't hardly make that stuff up. They were afraid of people getting better. They were afraid of life getting better. I'm convinced there are some people today that are afraid their life might get better. And they don't know how to deal with it. A lot of them are end up in prison. They become what we call institutionalized. They, they worry that they can't figure out how to live on the outside. And they'd rather stay in the, the pits of their situation than to get well and to get on the outside. And they, they turned on Jesus. After Jesus heals this man, they, they turn on Jesus. It's the same thing that happened just a little bit later in his life, on Sunday he walked into a town and everybody was cheering. By Friday they were shouting crucify him. All because the Pharisees <coughs> excuse me, stirred things up against Jesus. They killed him on Friday. But the equalizer came back on Sunday. And that's really what it's all about. So how do you and I how do we deal with being bullied, with being persecuted, uh, with being harassed? I want to give you real quick, and we're going we're to go through these pretty quickly, and we'll be done. I want to give you seven things to do. You may want to jot them down or wait till the very end, and there's one slide at the very end that's got them all up there. But here are some ways that I think biblically we can respond to bullying from Satan, to persecution, harassment. Number one, recognize the source behind the bully. Recognize the source behind the bully. These seven things are great. I, I was just studying this week and, and found these. Rick Warren had talked about these like in 2017 or something like that, before some of the current things we're dealing with even happened, pre-COVID and all the other stuff that's been going on. And, and number one was recognize the source behind the bully. See, the source of the bullying is a force that we have to deal with. And when bad things happen, 
when things like that that you know is just, it's, it's not right, it's not anybody's fault, it just, those things come from the pits of hell. They come from a force. And, and sometimes Satan uses, uses innocent people to perpetuate the things that he's trying to do. I don't think those people on the hill that day were like bad people. But they were being used to stir something up because they were scared and they didn't know. I'm convinced that about 99% of people who are being used by Satan as a bully don't even realize that it's going on. They don't even realize, they think they're doing the right thing. They think they're helping out. They think they're, they're, they're doing something great and they're just a pawn in Satan's evil plan. But we're called to remember that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against that person. It's against what's going on. And prayer, prayer is the weapon of our warfare. That's why we were reminded about it this morning when we sang together, that this is how we fight our battles. It's not against flesh and blood, but, but prayer and the Word of God, that's how we fight our battles. And sometimes... You know that line in the psalm that we sang? It may look like I'm surrounded. Have you ever felt surrounded? Maybe this week. Maybe this week there was a moment in this week when you felt like everybody that you knew was out to get you. Or it seemed like that the situation you were in, there was hopeless. And you were completely surrounded. It may look like you're surrounded but I'm surrounded by you. And that God wants to be there. God wants to be, he is there. He wants you to recognize and know that even in those times when it seems like you're surrounded, recognize the source of the bully. Recognize the source behind the attacks and know you're not alone. The second thing, remember this. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. Here's the thing about bullies, even, even satanic ones, is that they can, they can smell weakness. They can smell weakness. And, and that's where they're going to attack. Remember who defines your identity? Remember who defines your identity? Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 tells us who defines our identity. In Galatians 2, 20, Paul said, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's who defines us. You are not what people or who people say you are. I am the great equalizer, says you are who I say you are. You are who I say you are. Listen to 1 John chapter 1, or excuse me, chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 says, but you belong to God. I mean, we could just like stop, close Bible, let's go. That's, that's all you need. You belong to God. But you belong to God. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Remember who you are. Remember the price that was paid for you. Remember the effort that was made to leave the 99 and come and find the one. Remember all those things. Remember who and whose you are. How many of you had a parent, mom, dad, maybe both, that, that you were 16? You're finally going to start driving on your own? You, you were going out on the town that first night by yourself? And probably some of us in here had that talk given to us by our parents. Remember who you are. Don't do, don't do anything to mess up that, our last name. Remember who you are when you're out there. And we need to be reminded that we have a loving father that's saying, just remember who you are. I paid for you. I created you. I paid to get you back. I bought, remember who you are. Third thing. 13. Refuse 
to retaliate. Oh, snap, man. That's, that's the one I look forward to. That's, uh, that's, you know, there's a part of me that like, you know, is kind of always like, you know, always like strategizing, like if this happens that I'm going to do this or this, and that's human nature because we want to figure out how to stay ahead. But, but God tells us to refuse to retaliate. In fact, Paul was pretty just directly specific about it in Romans chapter 12. He said, never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. <laughs> now, this is the good part. I'll just summarize. He said, leave that to me. <laughs> I got you. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. You don't worry about that. Because in the end, we're going to sort it all out. Jesus told about the wheat and the tares, and at the end, the farmer would separate them. And he's saying that the Holy Father is going to separate things. You just do the best you can to live the way you're supposed to live. Don't worry about the bully. It's all going to work out. There is a great equalizer, and everything's going to work out. There are some people in life... This would be a really good time not to point, okay? But there are some people in life that you just can't get along with. They're, they're going to blindside you. They're going to throw cheap shots. And God tells us to just walk away. Don't get caught up in that. Don't get caught up in it. Don't feel like you have to have the last word in every disagreement. Because you know what? Bullies can't stand to be ignored. Bullies can't stand to have people just walk away. What fuels their fire is once they know they've got you. You guys, some of you guys like to fish. You like to fish? Yeah, you throw the line out, and whether you've got a bobber out there that you're watching for it to go under, or whether you're fishing with artificial bait and you're waiting for the line to start moving, if you fish very much, you know that sign when the bobber goes down and the line starts moving, and you know, hey, I got something. And the bully's looking for that line in you. The bully's looking for that line to move and to know that he's got you. What, do you, what happens when you go out fishing and the bobber never goes down and the line never moves? You don't stay around as long, do you? Or you at the very least go look for another spot on the lake where maybe they're biting. You, you, you see, if, if you just walk away, the bully walks away. You can't stand to be ignored. And, and so we go down through this and we remember that we need to recognize the source and we need to recognize that all this stuff comes from the pits of hell. We need to remember who we are. We need to refuse to retaliate. And in opposition to that or in, in, in the other side of that is we need to respond positively. How do I respond positively to criticism? To bullying. How do I respond when people are lying about me, harassing me? I, I want us to do something together. I, I, the audience participation. Everybody needs to get hooked in right here real quick. There's a verse going to come up, and I want us to read this out loud together. This verse comes up. Let's read this out loud together. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Now this next one, let's read this out loud together. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. What? We need, to, we need to read that loud again, okay? Here we go. No, the, the, the next one. This one right here. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Do you realize who said that? The great equalizer said that in part of his very first sermon here on planet Earth. He said, I got this, so just hang in there, love your enemies, pray for those that persecute you. That person that doesn't believe like you do politically, pray for them. That person that's around the world right now doing all kinds of evil and horrible things, pray for them. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, and let me deal with it. That's what the great equalizer is telling us. The more positive the more positive you can be in a negative situation. And I know sometimes it's hard. 
I fail miserably at this far too often. But the more positive you can be in a negative situation, the more you are winning the battle. So refuse to retaliate and respond positively. Then number five, refocus. Refocus on what God says that means. Listen to these really, I think, difficult words that come from Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 4, he wrote, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you're going through. Oh my goodness, guys. I hope you're praying. I hope you're praying. Because I was reading this this week, and I'm just knowing in my heart that there are some blood-bought, born-again followers of Jesus Christ in Afghanistan that are living this out right now. Don't be surprised as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad. For these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to all the world. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed. That's a promise. For the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. So, so what does suffering for Christ mean? Well, well first, it means, it, it means that somehow you're doing good. It means that somehow it means that God's spirit can be seen in you. Because if you're suffering for Christ, the one who is causing that suffering is doing it because of Christ. That means Christ can be seen in you. Keep it up. Christ can be seen in you. I think it also means God can trust you. God can trust you. He's going to be with you and he can trust you. He can trust you to stand firm. And I think it also means that the promise is clear. He will bless you. You could be, he, he can be seen in you and he trusts you, but he's going to bless you. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, he said, what, that is why we never give up. You ever felt like giving up? Thrown in the towel? I quit? That's why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and they won't last very long. Yet they produce a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen, for the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Understand this. It's hard sometimes, but understand, pain is temporary. Pain is temporary. It, 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 one way or another, it will eventually pass. And you know what they say about, no, about pain? No pain, no gain. That's to say there's no growth in a comfort zone, and there's no comfort in a growth zone. Pain is temporary. Pain is temporary, but the payoff is eternal. The payoff is eternal. Jim Elliott, the missionary, said, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep for that which he cannot lose. Refocus on what God says that all this means. Sixth thing, real quick, remember your reward. Remember your reward. In that very first sermon that Jesus preached, he finished the first section, the introduction to the sermon, the part that we know as the Beatitudes. He finished that introduction to the very first sermon this way. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Another way of translating that word is happy. What? Happy are those who are persecuted? Blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you. <clears throat> persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, sometimes you're going to be harassed. Sometimes 
it's going to seem the whole world, or at least your little crew of the world, has turned on you. You're going to be harassed, possibly in school, when you refuse to party with your friends. You're going to be harassed and bullied in the workplace when you refuse to be dishonest and you choose to work with integrity. You're going to be harassed and bullied in the world when you refuse to have sex with anyone that you are not married to of the opposite sex that had rings on. You're going to be harassed when you refuse to bow down to any of the idols of the world. But remember this, you will be rewarded. That's the promise of Scripture. That's the promise of the great equalizer. And so finally, the seventh thing, just remain faithful. Just remain faithful. Just do the right thing. It's tough. It's tough, right? It's tough, especially when it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. That's what makes it bullying. That's what makes it harassment. Just remain faithful. How easily, how easily, this is personal, how, how easily can you be convinced to not do the right thing? We, we get, Satan's going to give you all kinds of excuses. He's going to give you excuses, I don't want to lose my friends. I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to lose my boyfriend or my girlfriend. How easily can you be convinced to not do the right thing? But understand this. God is far more interested in your character than in your comfort because your comfort is coming. The great equalizer is in heaven preparing a place of comfort for all the blood-bought, born-again followers of Jesus Christ that have chosen to live for him. Let me ask you a couple of important questions as we close. This first one has been asked a lot for a lot of years, but probably in my lifetime, never really considered it a possibility. I gave you some, some staggering statistics early about things around the world. So let me ask you, if it ever becomes illegal in our country to follow Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict you? The second question is this, and I think this is going to become a more and more of a issue that we have to think through. When people insult other Christians around you and you see it or you hear it, do you wimp out and say nothing? Or do you take a stand for your brothers and sisters? See, the bottom line is bullies want to control us. Satan wants to. Satan wants to manipulate you. Satan wants to control your future. And he wants to do that quite often by reminding you of the mistakes of your past. But guys, listen, the only way your past can harm you, harm you, is if you let the bully control the narrative and tell your story. But Christ wants to be magnified. He wants to be part of your story, and he wants to help you tell the story. And God is looking for people who cannot be stopped because they know that Jesus is the greatest equalizer to bullies ever. God, thanks for loving us enough to give us Jesus. Help us to follow him with our whole heart and with everything we do. Help us to look to you to make things right in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you guys stand? Would you guys stand? We're going to sing together. If you need to make a decision for Christ, you need someone to pray with you, you just got questions, whatever, Jason's down here. We got other folks that love to spend time with you. But right now, let's just worship together. Let's make sure that we do everything we can so that Christ might be magnified.
have a seat just for one more minute, all right? Uh, first of all, this Wednesday night, uh, we kick back off our full Wednesday programming for youth and any of the adult studies and things that are here. So you can check the e-news, check the website and Facebook and stuff like that for all the stuff that's going on. Listen, parents, help us out. The doors open at 6.30, all right? We, we're not after school drop-off, okay? So this, the doors open at 6.30 to 8 for all of our youth programming and other stuff going on. And literally, the doors will be locked before that, so don't, don't drop your kids off, okay? Uh, so that's this Wednesday night. Uh, and this weekend, in fact, today in, in the third service, we're going to do something that we do at least once a year, and that's just pray over some families that have new little ones in their home. And so we had a time last night, a meeting with some of those families. Uh, and so that'll happen in the very beginning of third service today. So if you're hanging around for an ABF or something and want to come back in here right at 1130, Otherwise, we just wanted you to have the opportunity to see some of the families and some of the little ones that are being prayed over this weekend. So watch this video, and as soon as it's over, uh, you're dismissed. Say 